Gavin Gear here for makingwithmetal.com and ultimatereloader.com. This is part three in a three part series chronicling my adventure rebarreling a Winchester Model 70 heavy varmint chambered in 22 250. Part one was all about preparation and research. Part two was all about carrying out this job end to end. What does it take from start to finish to do a job like this? And in this third part, we're going to talk about all the tools all the equipment and all the supplies that you would need to do a job like this. Let's start with each of the things that you're going to need to think about that are specific to the chambering of rifle that you are rebarreling. The first thing you need to think about is the barrel blank itself. This is just a takeoff barrel, but it represents the barrel blank that you will start with. You need to think about things like the length, the twist rate, the contour, match grade versus standard grade, chromoly versus stainless, those sorts of things. Then you need to think about the chambering reamer or reamers that you're going to use. You can use a rougher reamer to take out the bulk of the material and chase that with a finisher reamer, but there's multiple ways that you can use only a finish reamer and get great results. This is a Dave Manson 22250 solid pilot reamer, so it's got a fixed diameter on the pilot, but these kinds of reamers are also available that use interchangeable bushings for the pilot area. They revolve with the bore and you can more precisely fit them to the bore dimensions for your particular barrel blank, which is a really nice thing. Then it's time to consider how you're going to indicate the barrel in and make it in perfect alignment with the spindle on the lathe that you're going to be using. I used Gordy Gritter's methodology for aligning the barrel to the spindle. That uses a grizzly bar that also uses these interchangeable bushings. These are 22 caliber, of course, because that's what I'm working with here with 22 250. You can also use something like a ranging rod that'll use a bushing on one end and a taper on the other. So multiple ways to get the job done and all with satisfactory results if the techniques are applied correctly. Then you're going to need a go no-go gauge set or just a go gauge. This is a go gauge for 22 250. And using Gordy's trick, if I put a piece of masking tape, which I miked at two thousandths of an inch, it can become a no-go gauge. Take off the tape, and it's a go gauge again. So, now that we've covered all of the sort of cartridge-specific, caliber-specific items, let's move on to assembly and disassembly. A torque screwdriver is an absolute essential. This unit is a Wheeler fat wrench. It reads in inch pounds, great for scopes, action, screws, that kind of thing. This is a Chapman gunsmithing screwdriver set. Again, when you're tightening screws on actions or stocks, anything like that, you're going to want to have the right tool so you don't strip the head or mar the screw head. And then I took on some tasks here like removing and installing the trigger from the action and removing the ejector from the bolt. I've got a Brownells green bench block here roll pin holders, roll pin punches, essential tools to get this job done and get it done right. Then we've got the tools to install and remove the barrel from the action. This is a Brownells barrel vise. I've got bushings for different diameters and it's a great way to remove a barrel from an action without marring the barrel and without twisting. This is the Brownells Action Wrench, set up for the Winchester Model 70. It grabs onto the integral recoil lug and then clamps onto the top of the action. That worked really, really good as well. And sometimes for these bushings, you need a little bit of extra grip. So I got some rosin grip. Did not have to use that in this particular case, but it is a good thing to have on hand nonetheless. So. Next, let's talk about precision inspection and measurement. So I used Lyman Borecam V2 to inspect the old barrel, which was roasted and toasted, and to monitor my progress on the inside of the new barrel. A brown and sharp, old school depth micrometer, great tool to have. Used it to monitor chamber cut depth with the headspace gauge, and then three different micrometers. Two of the new eye gauging easy data mics with half tenth resolution, easy to read displays. These are a little bit slower when you change the measurement that you're measuring. I still like to have a thousandth micrometer. This is a mitted Toyo unit here that's a little bit faster to back in and out. Zero to six digital caliper. This is eye gauging origin cal. This is perhaps the most frequently used tool. You can get a quick depth 
off of the end of it. You can measure inside diameters and outside diameters. This is a great unit, it uses a larger battery. Really like that tool as well. And then, of course, we've got a feeler gauge set, which you can use between the shoulder and the action when you're spinning it on to monitor, again, your chamber cut depth when you're getting to the very end when it's really precise. And at the heart of it all is the metal lathe. This is my Precision Matthews PM1440 GT. I'll walk through some of the features that it has. These are the things that you're looking for in a gunsmithing lathe. The first is rigidity and precision. So this is a heavy machine for this class. It's 14 by 40, weighs about 16, 1800 pounds, something in that vicinity. It's got a headstock spindle that has less than a tenth of a thousandth total indicated run out. It runs pretty much dead true. It's got a tailstock whose quill axis remains in perfect alignment with the headstock spindle axis over its range of motion as long as you clamp it down to the same torque. It's got a four jaw chuck, that's an absolute essential. I've got these aluminum pads that I use between the chuck jaws and the barrel. They do two things, they protect the barrel from scratching and then they, since they are very narrow, they actually allow the barrel to yaw slightly when you dial it in from the outboard spider side. That was another project. I built an outboard spider, clamps on with a pinch clamp, turned out really, really well. So this is the kind of machine whose capabilities you're gonna need if you're gonna do gunsmithing. I've also gotten used to the DRO, which is really, really awesome, and I would not be without it on a lathe for this type of work. Let's look at some of the tools that you're gonna to need to actually dial in the barrel. So I used two sets of indicators when I dialed the barrel in. I used my grizzly bar, as I mentioned before, with the appropriate bushing attached inside the bore and started with a thousandth indicator on a generic Noga base. This has the nodding feature, which is very nice to get things rolling. Checked at various depths, got that running true, and then I switched over to another Noga base. This one has the, the multi-jointed arm, which is actually really nice. You can get it situated just perfectly. This has a, the head nod feature, which enables you to get that, that range of indicator movement centered perfectly. I then ran the bushing in and out again and worked the four jaws and worked the outboard spider until it was absolutely dead concentric. Then it was time to cut. Let's take a look at the cutting tools. So my lathe has a quick change BXA style tool post on it. And so I've got a set of BXA tool blocks here with the cutting tools that I used for this particular job. We start with a regular left cutting tool. This was used to turn down the diameters for the tenon and the threaded muzzle. And then I've got two sides here that I used on a high-speed steel parting blade. The thinner side for the shoulder clearance on the threaded muzzle and the wider side for the shoulder clearance on the tenon side. I used an indexable tool, a 60 degree threading tool, and this did not give me the best finish. So if you guys have recommendations, I'm kind of thinking to try like an Arthur Warner high-speed steel indexable threading tool, something like that. Hopefully I get better results on that next time. I used a small boring bar to cut the chamfer for the entrance of the chamber. And I have a custom adapter here. This is a half inch adapter for quarter inch tools. I'm running it in a 5 8 BXA tool post. Works great though. And this was a quarter inch carbide tool that I sharpened extra sharp at the point here for cutting the recessed muzzle and the crown. That worked great. So here's some of the tooling that I used for the chambering process itself. I've got a Dave Manson 22250 finisher reamer mounted to a JGS precision floating reamer holder. I've got this piece of angle aluminum clamped to the floating reamer holder and that is indicated by a dial indicator. Now when I advance the chambering reamer I can see in thousandths of an inch how far it's going. Really important when you get down to that last 10, 5, and then 1 thousandths of an inch. What's really cool with the Mighty Mag is I can just pop this off and stick it down here. For the chambering process, I used Viper's Venom. This is a high sulfur oil recommended by Bill Marr of rifleshooter.com. Really, really good stuff. I also used my go gauge and a depth micrometer. Based on the math I did, I could monitor my chamber depth based off the shoulder reading while the go gauge was against the depth micrometer. And then a set of feeler gauges to spin on the action, take a measurement for the gap with the go gauge in place to see exactly how far you need to go. Again, when you get down to that last 
five thousandth, last one thousandth of an inch. The last thing I did on the lathe was to polish the barrel with some sandpaper. Now go over to Gritter Shows using a barrel spinner, which is great. You can use it on a buffing wheel or whatever. What I did was I made essentially a thread protector, 5 8 by 24. This is an aluminum sleeve here that I could put in the four jaw check. I threaded the threaded muzzle into that and put a live center up against the chamfer on the entrance to the chamber. Rotates with it, doesn't do any damage to it at all. I could then spin the barrel, sand it, do whatever I needed. I actually also did a cold blue job on it with some Birchwood KC Super Blue. More of a touch up product, but it actually worked pretty well. So my final plan is Cerakote, but this worked really good to get everything prepared. And then I hand engraved the chambering, the twist rate on there. I do want to get a suitable letter and number punch set and eventually laser engraving setup, but all in good time. Whew, that was a lot to cover, but don't worry. I've got a full write-up if you click on the first link in the video description below. I'll list all this stuff out. You can even print it out for reference if you want. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you don't want to miss all of these awesome gunsmithing stories, reloading stories, metalworking stories, subscribe to Gavin Tube, turn on notifications. Until next time, happy shooting, happy reloading, happy gunsmithing, and happy metalworking. Thank <laughs> you.